Thank you, Larry. Uh, unfortunately, this session isn't about me this morning, so uh, I will just uh, take a couple of moments to introduce our two next uh, speakers. So, Johan Cardell from the Swedish Police is uh, going to make his presentation this morning on the workload of the de uh, dedicated few in Stockholm. Johan's thesis examines the workload of officers in Stockholm on an hour-by-hour -hour basis across a period of one week and the resulting implications in terms of reported injuries. Detective Chief Superintendent uh, Simon Rose first studied chemistry at university uh, before joining the Met in Holloway. Uh, Simon is now the police commander for Barnett, uh, a community with over 50,000 Jewish persons of uh, a multitude of denominations. Unsurprisingly, this particular borough has a high level of anti-Semitic hate crimes. Simon's thesis is titled, Developing Solvability Strategies for Anti-Semitic and Islamophobic Crime, an Exploratory Analysis. So, Johan, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Johan Kardal from the Swedish Police, a uh, graduate from this course. I'm going to talk about my thesis about the workload of the dedicated few. That's the emergency response officers in Stockholm dedicated primarily to, to handle the incidents that require immediate response. I'm going to talk to a few graphs, but first we will use this one. The key research question is really about how do the hours the emergency response officers work correspond to the demand for when, when are the incidents that require immediate response, when do they actually happen, and are they in balance, are they aligned with each other, and what are the consequences, when do the, these officers report injuries, work-related injuries or incidents. Uh, in the thesis, I tried to explore the seasonal variability, but that didn't actually surprisingly show off. So I just didn't get no differences between these months. Uh, so I'm going to leave that out from, I have 14 minutes, I've been told. So we're, going, we're not going to talk about seasonality. We're going to talk about the whole year uh, and on the main results of the study. If uh, somewhere hidden in each picture or is my email address at work, the thesis is not available through Cambridge due to the Swedish police thinks that it's not going to hand out working hours freely to everyone. But if you email me at that address from your work, like force email, I will gladly send it to you. Uh, we're going to talk about, this is the sub-questions, we're going to focus just go through, through one and two the distribution of the hours the police officers work and the distribution of the incidents. And then we're going to see how they match up to each other and then show the, the, how they relate to the incidents and injuries. Uh, the data I've used is assigned patrol officer hours, the hours the police officers actually work during a week in the cars. During one average week in 2016, there's slightly above 15,000, 15,500 hours approximately spread out through the week. It's 2,657 incidents that require immediate response. The operators at the command center in Stockholm, this is for the whole county of Stockholm, uh, decide that we need to send a patrol car immediately. So 2,600 of those. And every week we get average 24.4 Work, reports of work-related incidents and injuries. It could be everything from people actually result in injuries that require sick leave and incidents that you couldn't have a lunch break and everything. There are divided incidents and injuries in the thesis, but not in the presentation. This is the first graph. I'm gonna talk a bit about this. this the, the following graphs will follow the same uh, pattern. The light blue, this is office hours. Every bar is one hour. And this is how much, so here is like half percent, four percent, no, 0.4 percent of the total resources of those 15,000 hours. So as we see, there's in the mornings, Monday mornings, increasing hours. The high singular bars, 
that's the overlapping shifts, so we can just ignore those. And I will show what happens when you take them away in the, uh, when you calculate statistically. But so we have a clear pattern. Up until, this is like five o'clock, the last light blue bar, and then continues to increase a couple of hours, and then it decreases again. And this is Friday, Friday evening and Saturday evening. Slightly more police officers. So we have, it seems like you have a pattern with peaks and throws during the week. And when we go to the incidents, yeah, do you have, on average, there are 92.6 police officers hours. Approximately, you would translate 92 police officers. In Sweden, you use double patrols, uh, so it would be 46 police cars on average in, in Stockholm County responsible for these incidents. This is, we have more police officers available because they have other, Mia Maria talked about the uh, uh, drug officers since they're not included in this. So there's more, this is not the total police resource in Sweden every hour, it's just those persons dedicated to the uh, incidents that require immediate response. This is the incidents that requires immediate response. I think the first time Larry saw this, he, he said it's too much order in the room. Because this is actually, it, it's, this is <coughs> strange for many reasons. We don't have higher peaks, I would say, Friday and Saturdays. It's just the same level as Thursdays and Wednesdays. So in some way, that's quite surprising. The, the difference is you have more hours with more incidents during the weekend nights. Uh, this is actually, I talked to the regional command center and asked them if there's something strange with the numbers or something, but they say this is actually how it is. We don't do anything with it. We just, we have the same standards of classifying incidents all the time, <coughs> every day, every hour. So I'm, I'm still not sure, but that's the answer I've been given by people I trust. And there's, on average, 16 incidents per hour, but as you see, they vary quite a lot from early mornings to late nights. So we have two, two different, two patterns. And, and trying to analyze them and see how they compare to each other, uh, I, can't, I divided the officer hours by the percentage of officer hour each hour with the percentage of incidents. So, if you have the same amount, 1% of the total hours and 1% of the incidents, you will have number one. If it's below one, you have more incidents than hours and above one, more hours than incidents. And doing it that way, uh, if it was perfect like balance or alignment between those, they would all reach up to this black line. But as you see, we have a lot more resources than demand early mornings, and then it starts to decrease and then goes up again. And it follows a pattern almost like a wave. So it's, it's, not, it's hard to say that we matched, we don't use police resources dedicated to the incidents uh, in a perfect way, I would say. Uh, we have some hours with more police officers and some perhaps lax police officers. This isn't really a good way of presenting stuff because it's not intuitive to, to understand what it actually means. So I did, I recalculated this like ratio into, back into hours. So how many hours surplus or deficit is it every hour? So here we see on Mondays, we have 10 up to here you have Saturday mornings, it's added to shift back hour. But this is the surplus hours. This is how many more hours we have uh, compared to the, to the incidents. And this is the deficit, the lack of hours. So we see we have sometimes more officers and sometimes, and you could redistribute them so you had perfect alignment. But the interesting thing here is to see what happens now, if we see, when do the officers report the incidents and injuries? 
the bars is the same surplus or deficit hours. And the, the dotted line is uh, if the in work related incidents or injuries are above or below average. So the middle line here, that's the average of reported. And we see here you have a lot of hours, it deserves more hours than you need, and then you have lower number of incidents reported. And when you have when you lack police officers, they report more injuries. And this is actually uh, quite consistent. So, but one of the things, this is in, th in the thesis, one of the things is, uh, is 2016 just one year? Uh, how does it compare to other years? And, and I'm a curious person and perhaps with too much spare time, and I know people who give me numbers, so I got the numbers for 2017 and, and did those just for fun and of course to show you. So we have the same pattern even next year. Uh, the, the difference is we have slightly more police officers hours during a week and slightly less injuries. But the pattern seems at least we can find them both in 16 and 17. Uh, statistics. I'm not going to go into this. We can discuss during the lunch break or you can email me. But they are correlated and they are it's statistically significant and the, the meaning of all this the red dots is the shift break hours if you take those away you get you explain more of the variance uh, and if you add one single officer for one shift eight hours for every week during the year you will you would reduce the incidents and injuries by almost one uh, and since we work double patrols in Sweden, you would actually increase by two, so then you would re reduce it by two in, St in, in Stockholm. So I think it's something worth trying. The same is found for 17. Uh, slightly, you wouldn't reduce as much, and we will, I will speak with Jeff or Larry how, how to do this. Uh, this actually is, we had a terror attack at uh, in Stockholm at Drottninggatan in April, and that actually got a lot of uh, reported, not so many injuries, but incidents, and a lot of those were lacking of uh, equipment. So there is a pattern with peaks and troughs, bo both for available officers and the incidents that require immediate response, but they are not really matched to each other. Uh, and the work-related incidents tend to occur more often when we have less resources in relation to the demand. And this points towards, you, you might want to take this the next step, and you can test uh, to prevent the work-related incidents by redistributing or hiring more officers. In Sweden, compared to other countries, we have now the political willingness to increase by 10,000 more police employees the coming years and about 7,000 police officers. So you might use some of those uh, to see to test this. Or you could prevent the incidents that actually uh, require immediate response. They're often high harm incidents and if you could prevent those, you would reduce the workload for the dedicated few. Or you could try to address the reasons, why do we report it? Is it injuries, is it, can you do it by training, better equipment and so on? So there's, there's a lot of, there's more steps to be taken along this road in Sweden to try to see how we can test this, uh, these results, this descriptive analysis. Uh, I think I'm done. Morning, ladies and gents. So um, my little bit of research um, is entitled Developing Solvability Strategies for Anti-Semitic and Islamophobic Crime. But really sort of in more plainer English, um, that is why some uh, faith hate crimes are detected and others aren't. But that has to come with a purpose, doesn't it? Because this is applied criminology and evidence-based policing. So it's with that to understand the why so that we can become more efficient with our processes, we can provide a better service to victims and we can improve the detection rate. 
So it's the purpose is not simply to understand the way the world is, but to change it. Righty ho. Um, the, the Met has got many, many problems. Um, but, but occasionally, uh, so it's probably best to get that out at the start, isn't it? But, but occasionally, some of those problems are actually useful. Um, so we've got a really antiquated IT system that records all our crime reports. But the benefit of that, you have the consistency of measurement of one database that, because it's so old, runs on drop-down menus that means it's really, really easy to code the information. And the Met also has perhaps more crime than Moss Eisley Spaceport. Uh, and that, in its own right as well, is actually terribly useful because the volume of crime you've got, probably now five faith hate crimes a day in London, over the 17 years of this analysis, gives 8,690 crimes to work with. Now, the only bit of faith hate crime solvability research that previously existed was a piece of work from America that only happened in 2017, and their sample was 819 offences. The granularity of the measurement that's available as a result of a much larger sample size is really quite useful. Um, so there's quite a bit of uh, solvability literature on violent crime, robbery and burglary, um, and using that uh, and a qualitative review of looking at 50 crime reports, uh, 27 solvability factors were identified, and then I, I go into doing some uh, bivariate inferential statistics and uh, binary logistic regression. Just briefly to touch on the point of the binary logistic regression, if you have a solvability factor, a, a, a factor that leads to a crime being solved that could be the response time or it could be the delay in reporting, those two factors are, are quite closely aligned together. And the purpose of the binary logistic regression, it could separate out the relative weighting or importance of two closely related factors. So, um, so the results. Um, I suppose the first thing to sort of point out that faith hate crime is really, really sensitive to global events. You can see it in the chart, the, the huge big spike in the middle is the murder of Lee Rigby. Um, then there's the Paris Bat Bataclan attacks. Um, and there's the church tax in Paris. So those are the three biggest spikes, but Brexit didn't really make a difference. Um, well, not to face that crime solvability. That's, that's another point. Let's just not even go there. Um, you also see from the other chart that there's you know, been a huge growth in faith hate crime in the last three years, and the levels of um, Islamophobic crime have uh, accelerated away, uh, surpassing anti-Semitic crime in about 2009, and it's... Uh, uh, going onwards and upward. Um, now, I'm just going to touch on sort of some of the findings um, in, a, in the short time I've got, to, but the purpose of the ones I've picked is to try and illustrate the opportunities for improvement and, and learning. Um, I've only picked on a, a three or four of the findings here, but there's a sort of two-page report that I submitted to the, ho the Home Office Hate Crime uh, Steering Group to try and leave us some change. So if anyone wants that, you're more than welcome to it, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, so with the findings, some of them are really you know, extremely intuitive. It's no surprise that CCTV matters. If you've got a, a faith hate crime where there was some CCTV obtained, the detection rate's 29% and it's 19% um, if there isn't. But why this matters is you can actually use that as a tool to lever officer behavioural change and victim community change. If they understand the value of CCTV to leading to a detection, you can incentivise the officers to go after the CCTV more and the mosques and the synagogues to install more or better CCTV. So it can make a difference. Equally the same with the delay in reporting. If there is a delay in reporting, the detection rate's 11%. If there's no delay, which is under 15 minutes, um, then it's 28%. Again, you feed that back to the communities, the Jewish community, the, commu the, the Community Security Trust, CST, or Tell Mama, which is measuring anti-Muslim attacks. You, if you get that information into them, they can share it with their communities and pass on the message to their, their groups that the importance of a, a, a rapid early notification delivers real change. Um, the last one I sort of picked on was four plus witnesses. Um, this is where you get some leverage into the officers, explaining that aggregated over a very large period of time, if you've got four or more witnesses, the detection rate is going to end up being 33%. If, there, if there's less than four, it's 14.9%. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's every crime, but it's a way of selling the factors that aggregated over an extended period of time will make a difference. Now, some of the factors were a little bit more surprising. Um, 
Witnessed by police, one would hope if police actually witness it, the detection rate will be rather high. Um, but there's actually a little bit more granular detail to that. Because what's actually happening is police officers are going along to deal with incidents uh, and there is already a, a borderline offence taking place. And the suspect in the presence of the police officer is just throwing in a bit of racial, religious abuse. Oh, you're nicked for that as well. Um, so that's actually what's driving that change. But, but equally within that, there's some interesting... Um, findings around the occupation of witnesses making a real difference. If there were security guards or bus drivers for some reason, that significantly increased the detection rate too. That links back then to the opportunity to leave a change with the officers when they're conducting an investigation. If there was a security guard witness, you get them on the list. Now we don't know why. It may be that more witnesses provide more um, collective reassurance uh, and that they're willing to, to take it forward. It may be that one out of four makes the identification and the ID, ID parade. We don't know the reason, but it's statistically significant and it's a big effect. Um, there's also one um, rather regrettably and professionally embarrassing counterintuitive finding that um, if the investigating officer is a senior detective, uh, the outcome rate is worse. Um, so let's skip over that one. <coughs> Um, so I wanted to just sort of touch on um, uh, sort of the, the previous research on, on faith, hate, crime, solvability. Up until now, all the sample sizes have been too small and they've had to aggregate them from multiple forces in America, um, principally in America, there's none of it been done in the UK. Um, the, and the initial findings that they'd had was they were concerned potentially that the different faiths might have different solvability factors. Um, now, there are multiple findings within what I found that actually prove this, but this is just perhaps a, a simple example. Um, if you looked at faith hate crime solvability, it would show um, we solve more crime for black minority ethnic victims than white victims. But it isn't actually the real truth. Because most of the members of the Jewish community are white, 76%, and most of the members of the Muslim community are not white, 86%, and the detection rate for anti-Islamic crime and anti-Jewish crime is different, it is actually linked to the crime type and not the faith. Um, so th I think the important point here made is that solvability needs to be, for faith hate crime, needs to be treated differently for robbery and burglary, where it's not crime type, you need to look at faith type um, as a separate issue. Um, the next one is the golden hour. That's a lie. Um, it's the myth that the TV detective ends of the 80s. Um, it's actually 15 minutes. Um, and that's useful because you get back into the Community Security Trust, tell Mama, and you start changing police policy. Uh, of in if you encourage channel shift to report online, you're actually going to increase the, the response time and actually have a worse outcome. Um, the, um, the final point I wanted to make is for a better use of forensics. Now, the two uh, black boxes on the left-hand side show the detection rate without asking for a forensic examiner to uh, treat an exhibit or visit the scene. 19% without, 15% with. So it's actually not helping. If you then translate in that into policy, you would, inc you would increase the threshold at which you send a forensic examiner to the scene. And there's a real danger here because... For criminal damage, it doesn't help. Public order, it doesn't help. But if you do send a, a scene to a crime officer to an assault, it doubles the detection rate. So the, the case I made to the Director of Forensic Services for the Met is you lower the threshold for going to assaults, you raise the threshold for the other two, you'll get better use of your resources and you'll get more detections for the same amount of officers. Um, so this really sort of links, to, to the, for me, to the Sir Dennis question. So what? Um, the, my last slide is not really an attempt to showboat. It's just really a bit of a pitch to the, the year one MST people, that you can really make a difference by getting the learning to the faith communities, by uh, you know, being persistent with your findings. I, I've changed the Met's uh, telephone in investigation use in policy, I've changed the Met's uh, policy forensics, um, and you know, with the help of Dr. Coop, you know, I've managed to get this in a book, uh, and it's getting presented at the Atlanta, Atlanta conference in, in 2018. Um, so it's just really a, a pitch, you know, to the year one MST, try and get a great supervisor, um, get something you're passionate in, and you really can make a difference. Thank you.
Okay, uh, Simon spoke about the, the value um, of the views of the community uh, and the importance in gaining their trust and how that can lead to uh, greater rates of, of in solving crime. And uh, he spoke about uh, the better use of forensic resources. And I think that was quite interesting um, when we look back to Johan's um, presentation where he has identified uh, the possibilities for efficiencies in the Swedish police, um, very importantly, you know, which is very important in the, the current global police climate where everybody seems to be wanting to, uh, having to do more with less. Um, but more importantly uh, for me as a serving officer, um, it was also about reducing officer injuries through the appropriate resourcing of staff. So uh, thank you to both gentlemen.